Hi everybody, Will Alexander from Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips, brought to you by Canine Chronicle TV and ProPlan, nutrition that performs. Don't forget to press the like, share, and subscribe button. Today's special guests in the time capsule are Enid and George Wright, the daughter and the son-in-law of the late, great Clifford Hallmark. So sit back and relax and enjoy an afternoon with Enid and George. Hi everybody, today we have George and Ian, right? Ian is the daughter of Cliff Hallmark, and George is obviously the son-in-law. Hi guys, how are you today? We're good. I'm um, as good as I can be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Things are well there right now? It's hot. Yeah, it's hot. Very, here. very hot. You don't want to be out doing gardening, put it that way. No, it's too hot. Even here, it's too hot to go outside and do that stuff, so... <laughs> Can you tell me how your dad got involved in dogs? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, well, the story really starts with my grandfather. My grandfather came over from Liverpool, emigrated to Canada, joined the Canadian Army, and fought in World War I in the Battle of Vimy Ridge in France, oh, wow. which is how he and my father got the kennel name, Vimy Ridge. And then he moved after the war down to Chicago, he walked over the border. Or however he went. <laughs> and my father was born in Chicago in 1920. And so my grandfather was interested from the get-go in wire fox terriers. Uh, and then in 1926, they moved to LaGrange, Illinois. And uh, my grandfather built a kennel. He started boarding, grooming, handling, breeding wire fox terriers. And so that's how he would have gotten his initial start in, in dogs. And you have even got the book he used to keep all his records in. Yeah. Yeah, my grandfather had this old ledger book where I can see the year he started building the kennel, how it was going, all his dog formulas for growing hair, if your dog had this problem, if your dog had that problem, all this kind of stuff you would probably never do nowadays. <laughs> yeah. I hate um, and so, so my father would have started going to shows with his father, you know, in the late twenties, I'm going to say, um, in the <laughs> Illinois, all right. that's all right. It's dinner time. So they're all bugging me. Oh, oh really? Okay. we we put right. our dog, we put our dogs away. So, <laughs> um, um, so his, you know, his, his first show would have been, um, in the Illinois, Kentucky, Ohio area, I'm going to say, something along those lines. I know he talked about going to shows via train with his father, you know, back in the day. And I know he spoke about Mr. Marvin and his father being their competitors in Wire Fox Terriers. Um, so, you know, he did that for a while. And then he, when he was a teenager, he got a job or got a job offer to work for a colonel in Kentucky. Oh, wow. um, it probably sounds more exciting than it was, but yeah. it was a Colonel R.L. Davis who had, had Davis Hill Wire Fox Terrier. So my father went to work for this Colonel R.L. Davis in Kentucky uh, when he was a teenager, and he was there for a few years. And while he was there, uh, one of the dogs that uh, was bred in the kennel was a dog called Davis Hill Little Man. He loved this dog. He thought the world of this dog. He thought this was the best wire fox terrier he had ever seen. Unfortunately, Mr. Colonel, Colonel Davis, sold this wire to Forest Hall of Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. And we know Forest Hall's kennel was called Hall Wire. And uh, this dog, little man, went on to sire um, many. He was an influential sire for him. He sired quite a few litters. Um, and we know Forest Hall bred over 100 Wire Fox Terrier champions. And later in life, he became a judge. And my father went on to win a Best in Show with a Wire under Forest okay. Hall with more Maid's Maestro. Oh. So there, the circle was complete, you know. <laughs> um, so 
George remembers that my father was unhappy when this dog was sold. Yeah. And so that's why he left. He left. So he came east to Long Branch, New Jersey. No, where, your grandfather came from. Yes, but to where my grandfather was already yeah. the manager of a wire fox terrier kennel at this time. So he was the manager of a wire fox te terrier kennel called Sea Swing. <laughs> Not a kennel I don't think many people are familiar with, but anyway. So he uh, lived and worked there with my father, went to shows with him and showed, you know, wire fox terriers, maybe some other breeds, I'm not quite sure. I know here in the East, I remember him saying there are competitors in wires were Jean Bigelow and her father who had Relu wire fox terriers. And, and so after that, he um, went up to Long Island and he took a job as an assistant to Len Brumby Sr., who was the handler of Champion Norne Sadler. Um, and he worked there for a few years. Um, and he met a lot of people while he was up in Long Island. Um, and so while he was there, he, he would tell us the story that he, uh, Len Brumby liked to trim his dogs at night. And so his job was to hold that dog like a statue while Len Brumby trimmed the dog not in a noose or you know anything he had to hold the dog so the dog would stand perfectly still and another actually fox terrier person worked for lem brumby at the same time phyllis haig i don't know if you're familiar with her but she went on to judge my father had a brief engagement to phyllis haig while the two of them were there yes so yeah so he left there and uh he started going to shows I'm not really sure whether he went to shows so much on his own, but he went to shows with people, more or less. So one of his uh, influential mentors that he went to shows with was Pop Sayers, so Ed Sayers Sr. Um, and he uh, showed a lot of carries. And all he was, carries. Yeah, all carries, okay. And he was sort of responsible for modernizing the, the carry blue as we, as we see it today for the, the trimming and things mm -hmm. like that. So while he was uh, on Long Island, he met all the Murphy brothers, and George can tell you who they are. Who? Who the Murphy brothers? Three brothers. Yeah. A lot of people don't know this. <clears throat> it was Johnny, Jimmy, and Harry. Harry was the last one to come over. Harry came over in 1946, 47. That's Desmond's father. Okay. And because. Uh, Jimmy and Johnny, they came in the 30s sometime. But they, and they, they were born just about seven or eight miles from where I came from, in a town called Glen Boyd, just outside Glasgow. <clears throat> Glen Boyd was owned by, it was a town, but it was owned by two brothers, the Chapman brothers. And they had Heather. Kennels. Kennels, the Scottish Terriers. I mean, you go back in Scottish, you'll see Heather, the, they sold a lot of dogs over here, and people went over there. And that's how mm -hmm. Johnny was the first one to well, came over, and they got but somebody gave him a job in a kennel. It was in New Jersey somewhere, I don't know where. And then Jimmy came after that. Johnny got him a job, but <laughs> Jimmy told me this. He says, "Nothing like your brother to do your favor." Paper. He said, he's working in a Scotty kennel. He gets me a job in an Airedale kennel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he said, what was a brother for? <laughs> so then, and, and then uh, Harry, he was in the army. Harry was a prisoner of war. Okay. And uh, this is, maybe a lot of people know this, maybe they don't. So was Roy Holloway, who was a prisoner of war. The two of them were in the same prison camp in Europe, but they didn't know each other. It wasn't until Harry came over here and they met Roy and they started talking. They'd be the same prison camp in France or Germany or wherever it was. So that, that's the story, the, the, the Murphy brothers. And, uh, and he met the Sayers brothers. So, you know, so I said he went to shows with Pop Sayers. Yes. So then there were three brothers there. There was Ed Sayers Jr., who went to work for Mrs. Dodge, you know, who ran Morris and Essex or, or sponsored Morris and Essex. Yes. And then there was Henry Sayers, who was a terrier handler. 
and was married to Ruth and then eventually married to Barbara Worcester. Yeah. And then the other Sayers brother was Joe Sayers, who, who went on to become a veterinarian and a breeder of Irish, Irish terriers. Yeah. 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 And he met all the, of course he met all the Brumbies. So, yes, and yeah. he was friendly with all of them. I mean, the East coast was terrier central. At oh, one Long, time. Island. Long, Long Island. Long Island. But the East coast, I mean, George Ward and his father lived in the East and. No, I never. Yeah. Yeah. No, his father never oh, came. His father, okay, his his father, father in Ontario. Uh, all right, I thought his father came down no. here for a while. But George, that's what George lived in the East. George came down, and what, again, he went from Ethel Kangle as well in Madison, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I heard that story plenty of times. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty and, yeah. and so during this time, my father showed for um, a few, you know, many people, but one of them, one of the stories he tells was um, he showed a dog for Captain Nicholas, who was Anna Catherine Nicholas's father. He showed a smooth fox terrier called Champion Pocono Prince. Now, this was around the same time that Brumby was showing Norne Sadler. And my father always maintained, and I guess it's, you, you could prove it if you could go back and look, that it's, at some shows when the two dogs were entered, they wouldn't show Sadler because they never want Sadler to be beaten. And so uh, uh, so my father said he did think Pocono Prince was as good a dog or could beat him, yeah. you know, maybe not every time, but on yeah. occasion and not maybe under the right judge. So, uh, but he was a lovely dog. And uh, we have a picture of him, as I say, somewhere. somewhere. Uh, and one day we'll put it online. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so an interesting fact that Mr. Austin, who owned Sadler, uh, was the stepfather of Betty Fell, who um, had Badgewood kennels and went on to be influential in Norfolks and breed uh, many Norfolks and Whippets. So. And Jack Sim worked for her. Right, and she was a judge as and well. So, yeah. so did, I think Hattie Murphy did work for her too. Oh, really? Okay. okay. Yeah. So a lot, of a lot of money out on Long Island at, at one time, yeah. yeah, in dogs, yeah. So. The, gold, the gold coast. So then... Uh, so then my father went into the Air Force okay. for the war, and he was a tail gunner, and he went over and was stationed first in Northampton, and then uh, in North Africa, okay, Northampton, England, and then in North Africa, and then Italy. Right. Um, and uh, when, uh, upon occasion, he would show us his bullet wound in his, in his leg. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So after the war, then he came home, and by this time his father was living on Long Island. He had bought a kennel in Westbury. Mm. And so I think my father started working out of his kennel and showing dogs on his own. So, um, yeah, so that would have been after the war. And then uh, I couldn't tell you all the people he showed for then. At some point he did meet the Worcesters. Um, who were very influential in his life. That yeah. wasn't until the 50s. Yeah, yeah, yeah the late, yeah, the, the 50s, you're right, yeah. yeah. So um, he met my mother at a dog show. Um, she okay. was showing it. Oh, yeah, okay. No. Nope. Your sister also married a dog person, a handler, or her, her sister also married a dog handler. Right, her sister Vera, yeah, <laughs> married Doug McLean, <laughs> who, who served in the Army in the Canine Corps. And so they met at a dog show. And actually, Doug's sister, Marion, married a handler, Ed Conrad. Who, yeah, I don't know you that. Yeah, 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 who was a terrier handler. And they ended up moving to New Hampshire at some point. But yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's incestual, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, it's just blood. yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, so my parents, yes, men at, the, men at a dog show because my mother got interested in dogs by working as a teenager for a chow kennel in a town near where she grew up. Um, it was called Elshire, and uh, the woman's name was Mrs. Prinz and, um, in Ridgewood, New Jersey. And so she started going to dog shows with her, and she worked at the kennel. She would tell the story how all the chows would be out, and when it was feeding time, you'd have to go in with a chair. And as you put down the food, you'd have to fend the chows off, <laughs> you know, and put the food down and work your way around, you know, so, so you could get out safely. Yeah. 
So they actually met in a chow ring. Um, the story goes that my father stepped on my mother's dog foot. So her dog went lame and he could win. <laughs> so. <laughs> that was your mother's story. But who knows? Well, he never, he never um, said otherwise. So. Um, so they got married in um, 1952. And so the other story goes is each one thought the other one had money somehow. <laughs> Because well, that, that's one from four. <laughs> yes. My, my mother went to Cooper Union at night. She had gotten a full scholarship. And during the days, she worked in PR in the sort of textile fashion industry. And one of the people she worked for was a man who was a furrier. And he would lend her fur coats. And she would go to the shows in these luxurious fur coats. And so my father thought, well, she's got money. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my mother always thought my father had money because he was well-dressed. And he, he probably was spending money like there was no tomorrow. My father wasn't. They loved to spend money. Yeah. And he was, gen he was a generous person, mm -hmm. so he would have spent money. So she would have thought, wow, he has money. And so actually, at that time also, his buddy buddy was Roy Holloway. Roy lived... Where did he live then? That must be when he went to Canada. No, Roy told me when we were in Long Island because Roy told me I used to go to your grandfather's house. Oh, really? And at that time, he said, you couldn't, you couldn't get a drink in Long Island. You had to go into New York City on a Sunday if you wanted to get a beer. And they would go there and the two of them would go into the city for a few beers. No. <laughs> <laughs> so that was him and Roy they were real buddy buddy back then he told me yeah well actually Roy was my godfather <laughs> oh okay yeah <laughs> so um, so they got married in 1952 and the story goes my mother was late to the wedding they got she's married always late <laughs> which uh, a fact that remained for the rest of her life um, uh, and uh, after the wedding actually they each went back to their own homes. My father went back to his parents' house. My mother went back to her parents' house because they had nowhere really to go at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so they did go on a honeymoon and then he decided he would take a private job and he went to work for uh, Edgerstone Kennels. So he worked privately for, she was Mrs. Epley then, she was Mrs. Winant before that, but her husband had committed suicide after the war and then she remarried but she kept the kennel and her interest in dogs and so he worked for her for three three and a half years and so while he worked for her and showed her dogs uh, my mother worked for General Motors in New York City in the public relations department yeah and so after she apart, no no she commuted the kennel was in Valley Stream New York no. so my mother commuted yeah yeah, so they weren't living apart, no. yeah. Um, and so so after she closed the kennel, um, she decided that was the end of dogs for her. She let everyone have the choice of two dogs. So my parents chose a Westie and a Scotty. And I can't remember exactly the relationship of the Westie to another famous Westie, but one was either the mother of Ed Edgerstone Valley Bell or something along those lines. The Scotty, I don't remember. Anyway, nothing came of the two dogs they got. The Westie, no matter how many times they bred her, never had a litter of pups. So <laughs> they weren't lucky that way. So, so, then, um, so then after that, they eventually moved to Mendham, where, you know, in, in the sort of mid-late 50s, and that's where they, they stayed. Um, so, but... Uh, somewhere during this time, they met up with the Worcesters, who, Mrs. Worcester, Florence Worcester, who was a, uh, I guess, a great woman. She was very outgoing, very uh, generous. Um, so she had, uh, she and her daughter Barbara had Wishing Well Kennels, and they lived in Little Falls, New Jersey. And Mrs. Worcester had been a past president of the Westie Club, I think, many times over. And actually, Barbara and her mother were founding members of Ramapo Kennel Club. 
Um, so they had, I re can vaguely recall going to the house in Little Falls. It was, you know, a lovely house. And then um, the they had a kennel. They had a wishing well there, of I course. Wish well. yeah. um, and it, it was a rather substantial place. I know I've heard nowadays that it's a huge housing development there. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, so my father showed for Barbara on and off. Um, and Barbara was, they bred a lot of dogs. They had wire fox terriers, Scottish terriers, West Highland terriers. Um, and Barbara didn't just have my father show for her. She had, you know, many handlers, George Ward. Um, so, uh, because George, George says to me something I didn't know. He said, my father told him that my father actually finished Simon, Elfenbrook Simon for Barbara. Then, then they, the fell out. The fellow and the fellow, the fellow and the fellow. <laughs> um, and so then the dog went to George. But my father did show Symmetra Snip for Barbara and went best in show at Montgomery with that dog. And the last dog he would have shown for Barbara was a dog was was a Westie called Champion Pin Money Puck in the early 70s, 73, 74, something like that, who was a top terrier. And, um, and that was her last dog with my father. Although when Mrs. Jones died, the owner of Harwire Hetman of Winladder, Barbara did want to buy that wire fox terrier, as did many people, but um, it just wasn't meant to be. So, um, but the last show I can remember Mrs. Worcester being at was uh, Montgomery in 1974, when my father uh, went best in show with Braid Home White Tornado of by Nate. Was she so, there that day? She was. Yeah. I can remember her sitting by the Westie ring yeah. with Dr. Kirk Judge. Yeah. So um, I think that I'm sure that was her last Montgomery. Yeah. Whether or not that was her last dog show, I, re I really couldn't say. So, wow. um, um, so um, you know, my father had a very interesting and varied life. You know, he. <laughs> He had been married two times before he married my mother. <laughs> married and divorced, I'll, I'll qualify that. Um, and um, he, uh, when they were in New Jersey, he met um, Mr. Milton Fox and his wife, Nell, who had pleasant pastures, Australian terriers. And he actually, this is when, before the breed was recognized, and he helped Mr. Fox, the two of them, wrote the standard for the Australian terrier. Wow. Yeah, and so when Mr. Fox died, though, um, he and Mrs. Fox didn't get along so well. <laughs> so that sort of came came to an end. Yeah. Although Mrs. Fox had given my mother uh, an Australian bitch, and she bred it. And my mother actually bred the first Australian terrier to win a terrier group. Mm -hmm. And it was called uh, Vimy Ridge Cricket. Wow. Yeah, so a little little interesting side note there, so... Your father also showed the first Border Terrier to go best in show. Yes, he did. Yeah, so that was owned by Mrs. Seaman, and he had bought that dog for her over in England. Um, and yeah, it was Dr. Huggins who gave him that first best in show. And actually, Wag went on to win the national specialty five consecutive times, which is almost a better feat than winning that best in show. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Um, they also brought other bought the the best in show. Okay. What was his name? Um, my memory is going. When I was over the dog, he bought on the bus going to Border Union. The women had the Border Terrier. Oh, Basil. Basil, yeah. Yes, I don't remember. That was the last border that. That he... was the last border he showed, and he got best in show with him as well. So there, but and then Border didn't get best in show, so. That was like two best in shows within you know, five or six years for both as well. <laughs> but in the 60s, my father went over to Britain a lot to buy dogs. He started then. Um, so he met a lot of people who were influential in his life over there. Uh, Joe Cartledge in particular, you know, helped him find these, some of these dogs. And, uh, you know, he bought a Border Terrier, Dandy Howe, Shady Lady from Mrs. Sullivan of Dandy Howe Kennels. Uh, he was very friendly with um, the Dennises of the Branston West Highland Kennels. Um, and uh, he was also very friendly with John Morris of the Mormaids Wire Fox Terrier Kennels. And uh, eventually he met up with George over there. <laughs> Tell us a bit about that, George. When you 19, 
I'm out, I'm at Windsor. No, it wasn't Windsor. It was the Scottish Stadium Club of England. They always had the, like, the national specialty the day before Windsor. And they had it at the Ascot Racecourse, which, uh, well, Ascot's changed a lot. You ever watch the horse racing from Ascot? No. Aye, if you keep them not interested, it's just dogs. Uh, anyway, it's a great, great race course, and uh, they had the dog show there, and that was 1969. And there's a lot of Americans there. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Kirk and his wife were there. Johnny Murphy was there. Doug McLean was there. My father showed Scotties for Dr. Kirk. Yeah. 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 Cy Rickle was there from Texas. Um, a lot of people from America, not America, came over for the, like the Scottish, they were Scottish people, and for Windsor. So that was that then. The next day at Windsor, I was showing a Westy bitch, and uh, I won the CC with her, and uh, they were watching Westies. Let's say her name, George. A name? Yes. No, no, I can remember. Champion Czech Bar Remini Rye. But I had finished her son that year. She wasn't finished. The people who owned had bred her, and they had this young dog. And as I, I, I wouldn't go into the story, but it was a really nice dog. I came out, <clears throat> and over there, I finished him in like 10 weeks. We don't have many shows. He won at the West yeah. National. He got the CC at West National. Um, what was the other show? I remember I finished him at Leeds. I got his first CC in March. Manchester. He got his first CC at Manchester in March. His second CC at the West, the West National under Miss Wright. No relation. She owned the Kaluna Kennels. So he says. Yeah. yeah. Kaluna West Highland Kennels. And I finished them under <clears throat> at Leeds Championship Show under uh, Les Atkinson. Did you ever know Les? No, you wouldn't have known Les. You know Judy Avaris? Heard the name. Well, it was Judy's father. He was a great guy, yeah. And he was a young guy, he was in terriers. If you had something good, he put you up with it. He, he liked to help. If you were young, I was like about 19 there. He cut his way. A lot of the old guys were there and say, hey, you're up there. No, he put you up. Yeah, he, he, went, he, really, he went best in short crafts with the Lakeland Terrier. And Judy, his daughter, went best in short crafts with Welsh Terrier. That, that, so um, I got to know all those people. But anyway, I'm showing this Wesley bitch and I went with her. And they're all there, they're watching Westies. And Johnny Murphy said to Clifford and Doug McLean, I don't know who else was there, they said, one of you guys should take that kid back over to the States with you. So I had Clifford ask me when they come, so the rest has to, I came over, I stayed for two years, I went back again, then I came back again. So that's how we met. And uh, we were... Very good friend. We always stayed in touch, even when I went back over to Scotland. Um, actually, I bought the dog, uh, Great Home White Tornado. And Clifford, I told Clifford, I've got this Westie here. He's, this is a good, he's held a dick. He came over, saw him. He bought him, and uh, they go best to show from the classes at Montgomery? No. No. Was that the next year? He won the breed from the classes, I know that. Okay. Sure did, right? Under I'm saying nothing. Oh, <laughs> under the year he went best in show, he was a he was a special, I'm sure, under Dr. Kirk. But he won the breed the year before under Sheila Clellan. Okay. Right? So no. I'm sure I'm right. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. So I bought that dog. We'll look that up later. Dog, so. Okay. Tell me and tell me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's the story of me and Clifford and all those old guys from over here. Right? When you came over here, George, your first show, uh, what did you what did you think? Was it was it bloody, bloody awful? It'd been a lovely summer for once. 
that actually had a real summer in the United Kingdom. <laughs> the weather was brilliant. I get here on two days before, uh, the Thursday, the Thursday before Somerset, Somerset Hills and Westchester. And first of all, like Ryder Kennedy, you come out and it was so goddamn humid and hot. Yeah, you, that could, awful. you could cut the humidity with a knife. It was one of those days. Yeah, it's oh, it was awful. And then I went to the first show. It was only like 15 minutes from where Cliff and Lois live in Far Hills. And I loved, that was Somerset Hills. And uh, Dirty to rain must have been at five in the morning and it rained, it rained. We were up to our ankles in mud, the chairs down, creates on it. I said, what the hell, this is bloody awful. <laughs> no, I'm all cramped under a tent and that. But it dried up in the afternoon but before the groups. And uh, I said, I don't remember that day. And uh, I met. Fisher that day, Bobby Fisher was showing a Kerry Blue of his own. Okay. He actually had a Kerry, champion Kerner Fergus McCroy. And uh, he was a nice dog, lovely dog. He had him looking lovely. And uh, I remember going over and looking at him and <clears throat> uh, Bobby wouldn't mind me saying this. He looked lovely. That uh, this dog could only have moved. I mean, it, it was a picture, right? But he was not good, but when really. he went away from you, you had to turn your head away, right? Okay. And, uh, oh, no, Bobby won't mind you saying that. that uh, yeah, well, who the hell cares? Who <laughs> was this? And uh, they're like, no, maybe they'll say, well, George is right. No, no care. And uh, he was a lovely... George was, is blind. He was yeah. a nice dog oh. and a uh, fisher, but that day, I always remember... The Did he win the breed that day? What? Did he win the breed? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, he won the breed a lot. He got, actually, he got a couple of best in shows. Peter showed him once and got best in show with him. Because it was only like last year, the year before, uh, Ernesto asked me. He said he found an old dog book or something and he had a picture of Peter with good best, best in show with his carry. And he said, do you remember? I said, yeah, I said, that was Fisher's dog. Oh, he says, I wonder why it looks so good. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know I was actually Bobby's dog. And uh, they got a couple of beds, but the, that day, Tony Stam, the Ann Stam Scottish Terriers, he did the group. And Peter was showing the Farrells Lakeland special edition. He won the group. Clifford went second with Diego Hubert and Westy. Ali Earls went south with Gymnast, Dougal, Dougal Celium, and the Dandy went fourth. And I don't know the Dandy's name, but it was that Hugo. German guy. Hugo Reichlin. That's the German guy had it, and uh, he had some to show some nice Dandies. So I always, that stuck in my head from that day. Mm. The next day was Westchester, and it was a beautiful day. Yeah. And it was a great entry. I mean, the Kerry Blue special day there, and uh, somebody from England who judged, maybe Miss Parry, who that. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a beautiful day. And I met, that's the first time I met Jimmy Murphy. And Jimmy only came down from Massachusetts. He lived outside Boston. And he had a Kerry and maybe a West there, a Scotty. He only had two or three dogs. At that time, Jimmy never went to many shows. That's the first time I met Jimmy as well. That first weekend, I met a lot of people. I met E.J. Carver. Carver um, Alan Levine. I mean, so, I mean, a lot of people, they're all gone now. And uh, something, their name might pop into my head. But I met a hell of a lot of people the first two days I was in this country. <laughs> You and Clifford used to spend a lot of time in, well not a lot, but some time in Canada because I, I actually remember, remember meeting Clifford, I think it was in a, a show in Quebec, but you both came up a lot, showed yeah. up 
telling. There's a story about going to Barry one year, the Barry Kennel Club. Yeah. Well, we came up. I don't know. It was like it'd be this week. It'd be after. It'd be you no know, next weekend. It would be the end of July, and we came up. I think we went to like ten shows. There was a lot of shows. You surfed that that week. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, it was interesting. I had a good time, but uh, was, they won. They won every group except one. Well, I won two groups. Did a wire dog. What was his name? Craig Don. Craig Craig Lark. And I won two groups with him. I won one under Miriam Wait. Yep. And one under I think I went under New Egg the Eggberg. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah, and he won, <laughs> he won another seven where Westy had the uh, Pagan Ghost. And uh, so with that, the only time he got beaten the breed in Westies one day was uh, a guy, oh God, what was his name? He, he, I think he came from uh, New Brunswick, uh, on the East Coast, there was Hood. His name was, oh, how, how, some people you never forget, the guy who had fish eyes, <laughs> fish eyes, <laughs> and he, 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 he beat Clifford and Westies, oh, Clifford was, oh, he, was, he wasn't a happy camper, he came out of that ring, how did he put up that, and the guy could hear him, he didn't give a shit, and uh, <laughs> so he says, that's it, uh, I think it was the last show, man, we're getting out of here. I said, no, I said, the wires on at one o'clock or something. Show the wire. Uh, no, I believe. I said, show the wire. I said, you have a good chance of winning the group. I said, under this ass. I said, he doesn't know anything. I said, Chuck Heron is doing best in show. I said, if you win the group, you'll get best in show. <laughs> well, okay, we'll show the wire. So he shows the wire. Because I figured out in my tiny little Scottish brain, that they're going to have lunch together, the judges. And this guy is going to say to Chuck Ken, and who's this guy with the Westie? He was cussing at me and all the rest of it because I beat him in the breed. I said, Chuck Ken is going to say, well, you shouldn't have beat him in the breed. Hmm. No, there was a, a dog and Dennis, the all I had. No way I should have beat him. But <laughs> I said, we will see what happens. So, Mr. Who does the group, puts the wire up in the group. The second, and Clifford goes best in show, and got Chuck Herring in. So he's getting right after bed. The Herring group is the last group, so right into best in show, he goes best in show. So he's up with Chuck, and he's getting a picture taken for best in show. And there's Mister Hood standing there, like a beaten little dog, no, looking and there. Uh, so well, at least I got something right that went best in show. So I have a this picture. Mr. Hood says to him, Oh, would you like a picture with me for the group? Clever. Why would I want to get a picture with an ugly da da da? I would see what he said, like you, and walked away, and the guy, poor guy's left standing there. <laughs> we got a picture with him. <laughs> but, uh, that was one of the many. No, one of the funniest days was. And he saw it was, it was at Bucks County Dog Show. And, and you have been to Bucks County. It's never changed. To say I've never changed. It's a great show. Dog that. So, he's under the dog ready. So, Terriers will see in ring seven. So, they're on, I don't know. They started late, but some reason in the morning. But I remember Westies were in the afternoon. For some reason, you no know, other. The heat of the day and the West is on. So he, he goes over to the, to the right. And there's these two little old ladies. They're right at the entrance to the ring. The little table and they've got either last lapses or shit So when he looks at them and says, Get out the hell out of here. Well, what do you mean? You shouldn't be get those tables away. He's a chair with them. He was coming to sit down at the entrance to the ring. But and this, uh, he said, you shouldn't be here. Wait a minute, you shouldn't have those tables. I get out the hell out of here. And the woman turned around and said, 
You tell your people think you own the dog show. He said, you've got that right, lady. We do. Move. <laughs> <laughs> they moved. Nah, nah. I felt sorry for him. He sounds like, like a tough character. What, what I understand, he was pretty soft, actually. He was like, quite a soft. Oh, yeah, yeah. He put on the, the hard thing. I do. And you met a uh, dog show, some people say, oh, I drop me on my hand. Nah. But away from the, the dog show, it was entirely different. No. But. Very different. No. Yeah, he was really a sentimental person. person yeah, yeah, and he 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 loved kids. He loved encouraging kids at dog shows. Yeah. I was yeah. like ten or eleven when I first met him, and he was great with me. So. Uh, uh, well, what did he actually say to you? Do you remember? We just talked about terriers. We're sitting there watching the terrier ring, and it was at a. I'm sure it was. I want to say it was a. I'm not sure it was the Montreal show because I think it was in a hockey arena. Because for some reason, I feel like we were sitting on a bench, like the the hockey bench, watching. The, the dog show, and I, I think, I think back then Airedales were my favorite terrier, and I was, think I was asking about Airedales. I didn't know who he was at that point. Right, right. Which is very, I just remember the whole experience. I still remember it, so obviously it was a positive one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. He, um, well, he didn't suffer fools. Uh, let's put it no. that way. No. Um, and he, he, uh, yeah. He paid attention to his dog at the show. If you were coming over to chit chat, he was busy with his dogs at the setup. He would just turn his back to you. He couldn't be bothered, yeah. you know. Um, so, but to the, the box, the, I'm sorry, the box he had. I mean, he went best in show in the comedy four times. Three times with Westies, right? One was Barbara's. Symmetra Snap, then he went best in show with Diego Huber, he went best in show with White Tornado, and who's the Scotty? Why not be watching? Who, again, <clears throat> that Scotty Betch actually won the group at the Garden, but the owner showed it because Hart and Clifford came to a parting of the ways again. <laughs> well, they had a falling out, what that was, I don't know. Oh. He the story went. She begged him the morning of the garden to show her that day, and he refused. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if he was ever sorry, sorry that he did. did. Uh, probably not, though. Knowing my father, uh, he probably wasn't sorry right. in many ways. So, um, so what were his favorite dogs? Do you remember? Uh, well, obviously the Westies. Yeah, a few. Yeah, he did have a few. So, yeah, you know Harry Harwire Hetman. Yeah. And uh, the wires that he loved, and he, he loved more maids maestro and barrister and barrister, the one yeah. The garden. And he loved that wire, you know, little man from way, way back, back in the day. <laughs> and then he he loved Diego Hubert, yeah. who was really a, a great show dog for him. And he loved White Tornado. Um, and then he loved a boarder called the uh, Dandy House Shady Lady, who lived in our house until the end of her days. Yes. Um, yeah, and then he also loved a wire fox terrier called Shearwater Suntan, who, whose name was Joy, and he showed her for a Mr. Hill that lived here in New Jersey, and he actually ended up giving her to my father because uh, when we were young, I'm going to say I couldn't have been more than three years old, uh, she was in a whelping box in their bedroom, and, she, and my sisters would have only been a year old in their cribs. And she was in a whelping box in their bedroom. And she started barking one night. He's yelling, shut up, shut up, you know. And she wouldn't shut up. She, if anything, she became more insistent. So he finally got up to see what the heck was going on when he could smell smoke. Oh. And so he realized that she was alert. And so there was a fire. There was a fire. Uh, and so, you know, she saved us. So uh, we all got out. The dogs all got out. And he, he didn't want to ever part with her. She was our savior. And from till the day she died, he took care of her. She was the star at one of my birthday parties. Everyone posed with her when I was a kid. And when she was getting older, he would make tea because he was convinced that tea was the elixir of life. And uh, he would serve her tea, you know, Joy needs tea today. And so she was a, uh, you know, he really did love that dog. <laughs> There's a soft side, yeah. Yes, yeah.
you know, he's remembered as one of the greatest terrier handlers of all time. If, what, what advice do you think he would give to today's terrier handlers? Well, okay. Well, he would just say, you know, um, learn your craft, you know, um, uh, learn the history of the breed. Um, read and, the books. Yeah, read the books. You know, don't just be somebody who takes a dog in the ring and you're paid for it, you know. Really know your craft because, you know, with terriers, a lot of the handlers truly are artists when it comes to training their dogs. Okay. Um, yeah. And he would say, and, and know, know your own self-worth and, and always be paid for what you do, you know. Um, so I think that would be his advice. And he would, he would be encouraging to any young person that wanted to be involved in dogs because I, I think he thought it gave him a great life, you know, a life that he couldn't have had in many other ways because you meet all sorts of people, you know, um, and you go to all sorts of places and you see all these wonderful dogs and it's, it can be a wonderful life, you know. So I think he would, he would you know, be encouraging that way. Wonderful life. Look how you met me. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about it. If I had been for dogs, we would never have met, right? No, exactly. No, no. <laughs> I can't remember. I knew you, but I got to really know you. We were in Montreal, and you lost the breed in Westies. I think you were showing, it might have been Pilot, and you were very upset to who was judging, though. You're, you're really angry. It was a woman. I can't remember who. Oh, it was. I remember her. <laughs> Missy's, Missy's. Oh, God. He was really upset that you were so upset. I can't remember who it was, though. I asked her, Madam, could you tell me how, why you put that bitch over this dog? It was Alistair I was showing. Oh. Ask you, Alistair, to him. And she said, oh, I liked it better. And I said, in what way? Oh, I just liked it better. I says, madam, my four-year-old daughter could give a better answer than that. <laughs> she called the Ben Show Committee on there. Oh, it's coming to me. I, I, I bet, I'm starting to remember it. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a Canadian woman. As you came to me and you, you sort of yelled at me about her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember who it was. And so you're responsible for her, right? Because you're Canadian too. Yeah. I really made it up here. <laughs> but to us, it, uh, you know nothing about West Island White Terriers. I'll tell you a funny story. A couple of years later, more than a couple of years, maybe it was 10 years later, Bert Tormey. Margaret Robertson. That's a Robert. I knew that's Scots and that's a yeah. Sorry, it just came to me. <laughs> oh, a fellow Scots person. <laughs> so <laughs> makes it worse. <laughs> oh, it's going to be more than ten years later. Bert tore me. Came up to me and he said, "Do you know a lady called Mrs. Robertson?" <laughs> and I said. I'm thinking locally, oh, I don't know. I said, no, I said, I said, I was judging out in Washington State last week. He said, and we were at the judge's dinner. He said, and there's this Canadian woman, Mrs. Ro oh, I said, yeah, I remember her now. <laughs> he said, she started talking to me. We're having a nice conversation. And she asked me where he came from. He says, I live in Connecticut. And with that, she said, do you know a handler down there called George Wright? <laughs> and Bear said, oh yeah, I know George Wright. <laughs> she, said to she said, do you know what he said to me in the ring? And Bear said, no, so she tells him. And he said, he said to me that he could take, he should, what was it he said? He could teach me about terriers. And Bear Looked and says, I probably could. <laughs> she never spoke to me for the next two days. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, I remember you were hot. She yeah. never forgot me, that's for sure. <laughs> I'll just say, back in the day, though, Bert Tormey would have been exactly the same. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
she didn't forget me. No. Now you made an impression, for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Definitely. The everlasting. Not a, not a good one, though. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what the hell. It's only a dog show. Yeah. Yeah. What do you so. think um, your dad would think of today's dog shows? Well... The shows are, you know, sort of the same in some ways, you know, that they're conducted the same. There are no Foley guys anymore, though, unfortunately, you know. They knew everything that was going on in dogs, really, more than the Hamlers did. Nice. But anyway, um, uh, he would be shocked that um, at the end, at the, at the low terrier entries, you know, um, and he would be shocked that one of his favorite shows, Monmouth County Kennel Club, was no longer exists. No. So um, I just think he would be surprised that um, you don't see the breadth of breeders there once were, you know. Um, so I think all the all those things. Um, and that's basically no what you would call real kennels anymore. You have person who breeds a bitch once every two years and they think they're going to be the great one. They don't have the kennels where they, they bred 10 letters a year and you could turn them out one after the other. And But it's just a changed world. Well, I mean, it's just a changed business. Right. It wasn't uncommon, I'm just going to say, in the 70s, at least I can speak to that period very well, that he wouldn't, that he would have a, you know, a Westy class bitch, dog, and a special, and the same for Scotties and wires. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that just sort of doesn't exist That's anymore. Incredible. And like George said, a lot of his clients were people who, who were breeders, who were interested in a breed and were members of their local dog club. And they would breed a litter every two years and that, and they would keep something and that would be the dog they would show and they would give that dog to my father to show. And, and that just sort of really doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. You're right. It's just a sort of a shame. It is a shame. It really yeah. is. It's in Canada, right? Well, for sure. It's, it's, I mean, it's through dogs. But we had more depth than we do now. Right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's just sort of missing. Yeah. And yeah. yeah and then people just don't keep the numbers of dogs they once kept. You know, it's, it's almost we went through a period of time where you were frowned upon if you kept too many dogs, you know. But really, that's how the good breeders really, you know, sure. you know. Yeah. They rarely the, lucky you have one litter and have a great one. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I bet you. Oh, I've got this one. It's great. Oh, and you look at that and said, "Um, it's all in the eye of the beholder." Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just tell one more, one more story. That um, okay. So I told you the sort of the sentimental one of my father. Here's the another side of my father. So when I was a kid, I'm going to say maybe you know, nine years old, it was the early 60s, I went on the New England circuit with him. So we had a couple shows in, and then one show, we did not have a good day. I think he got beat with everything, or his two, like, the two dogs, the two dogs that he would have uh, shown in the group. And so he said, okay, the terrier group was going in, we're packing up, we're leaving. I said, okay, so we packed up, we got in the van, but instead of heading for the exit, we headed for the terrier group ring. And then, yes, we were in the van, and he decided we were going to circle that terrier group ring, and he was going to shake his fist and honk the horn at this judge, which he proceeded to do while we circled the ring three times before we finally left the showgrounds. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're going to ask me what happened the next day, I no longer remember. I must have blanked that right out of my mind, but I've never forgotten that how everybody in that group ring turned to stare at us as we were driving around the ring while he shook his fist at the judge. <laughs> yeah, so. Oh so that was the other side of him, the side that didn't want to lose, you know. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try that next time, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, would, I definitely advise it, yes. <laughs> well, but, yeah. Where did George go? Did we lose George? We lost George a minute. He has somebody picking up a dog he groomed earlier. All right. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that we, that we need to cover? No, well, I'm just going to say, well, going back to how, you know, there are more shows than there ever were nowadays, right? You know, we'll, we'll see three or four day weekends. But back in the early 60s, you know, they were only two show weekends. And so uh, because they were only two show weekends, you'd get tremendous entries. You know, there would be majors at every show and everything. And there wouldn't even be shows every weekend, every of the month. 
So one year in the early 60s, my father finished 35 Scottish Terrier champions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's so. It's not happening. That was, yeah, I, yeah, I, well, it's just circumstances would never let that happen again, you know? So, and, uh, the only other thing I would want to say is that, um, he'd be proud of his grandchildren. He'd be proud of my daughter continuing in dogs and his, my son, Matthew, um, he would, um, who looks just like him in oh, many really? ways. Yes. Um, he would share the same interests. He was, my son's a golfer. My father was a golfer and my son's interested in getting not a terrier, unfortunately, but getting a Nova Scotia duck trolling retriever. Okay. So, but at least a continuance in dogs at any rate. So he would be proud of that. Yes. Um, so I really appreciate your time. Ian. It's been a okay. Great time. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, here's George. Any last, I'm back again. any final words, George, final words, George. I had to go and collect some money. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know what. I don't know what to say. <coughs> uh, because, yeah, just the dog world's changed. Not only in North America, even go over to the UK. Scotland, England, Ireland, Wales. A lot of the good old breeders, they've all died off. And they're not taking the place. Yeah. The entries have went down. I mean, uh, when sure was that? A couple of years ago. That's not, it's 10 years ago. We went to Windsor. And how that dog show had changed. Oh, when we went up there. Yeah. Yeah. There was only like... Well, there weren't CCs in every terrier breed. That no, was for sure. there was only there was only like six or seven Lakelands in those CCs, right? The biggest entry, I think, was was it Norfolk's? Maybe. The unreal Norfolk's were one of the biggest entries, right? <laughs> there was only like twelve wires. I mean, it just completely changed. Okay, you go to cross a national terrier, you got a bigger entry. But the other championship shows, uh, I went to. Bought the Union show, that'd be two years back, the Scottish Kennel Club, that two years ago. And I went over to the English Cocker ring. There was only like 14 English Cockers. Now over they used to have back, when I was a kid, no, back in the 60s, 70s, there'd be 70 or 80 English Cockers, right? Yep. And it was unbelievable. It just went downhill. No. So. I drink. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it will rise again, but eh, the living hope. But uh, Yeah, people have to be more interested than in just showing dogs. You have to be, we, have, we need the breeders back as well, you know. The breeders back and <laughs> one last thing I'll say. A lot of young people coming into dogs today. They might go the weekends and work for a handler for a year. Then they decide they're going to be a handler. And they'll be picking up dogs and be running around and all they want to do is pick up a dog, go in there and be a star for two minutes, run round and round, right? Yep. So it's just changed, no. And I see, I don't know if it's like in Canada, but I see them here all the time. You know, well, I haven't seen any this year, but but last year, they, you see them all, and the kids in the, you know, they all want to be, they're only like 16, 17, and that, but they're handling dogs. Yeah, so, I mean, my yeah. father served an apprenticeship, as did George, you know? So um, I would say most most terrier handlers have, you know? know. Yeah, so any, any of the breeds, even not just terriers, just so yeah. Learn about them that you you have to have a background before you're willing to take someone's money to show their dog, I think. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But hopefully the let's hope the shows just continue like that the way things are going. Yes, there's a show going on right now in uh in Bloomsburg, I think, right at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. 
And we're going to Canfield next week. My daughter wants to go. She entered two dogs, so. Right. <laughs> so and you, to Canfield you see the that. entries there? 3,700 dogs on this yeah. Saturday. Three. Yeah. We're back to, to the way it used to be. Yeah. Yeah, and I've got majors. Actually, I couldn't believe it. I saw, well, Scottish Terriers, there's like nine class dogs and ten class bitches. Yeah, we've got that. There's six wire bitch in the classes. <laughs> What does that tell I you? Mean, maybe, maybe we should have fewer shows. So. Exactly. Maybe this will be a big reset button for our dog world. Yeah. yeah. That'd be but, like. Uh, now nah, the Kennel Club just wants to have all these shows. They've got to get in the money. No. Well, let's hope. Let's hope it goes back because that's that's. I I miss them and uh, I like I like the bigger shows. Yeah. 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 They're more exciting. Yeah. Again, thank you for uh, sharing your time with me, guys. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I hope you stay safe, and I'm sure I'll see at least George somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where. Uh, don't, well, I won't be this year, that's for sure. The, the border is closed, so it will be no time soon. Yeah. That. yeah. And I'm, I'm injured in some shows down there where I can't go. So. Um, you can sneak over the border at night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. Again, thank you so okay, much. Thank you, well. Have a great day, and thank you so much for your time. I really. You're, you're, you're welcome. Thank you're you. You're welcome. Hey. Bye. Bye. Well, thank you both for a very enjoyable afternoon. The memories were flooding back. I, it was it was incredible. I loved every minute of it. So don't forget to press the like, share, and subscribe button. And if you like what you're seeing here, don't forget to. Uh, Message me at dogshowtips at gmail.com or if you want to just find out what's going on at Will's World, just go to willalexander.net. Until next week, guys, take care of yourselves.